Um, <clears throat> a short while back, we looked at conservation of volume, and uh, we want to extend that now to conserve mass. That's a more general form. So suppose you have a fluid with density rho that varies in space and time. So as before, as we saw with V, uh, rho will be a function of x, y, z in time. Uh, so I now have a flux of mass through the box. Earlier I had a flux of volume. Now, if you consider the same sides as we did earlier, now instead of writing the volume flux as we did earlier, we have to multiply it by rho to get the units of mass flux. This will be in kilogram per second instead of meter cube per second. Kg per meter cube into meter cube per second, so it's kg per second. So the mass flux through side xz1 was, uh, the volume flux was V into delta x into delta z. Now it will be rho into V into delta x into delta z. That's all. Where rho is rho of x, y, z, t, and V is V of x, y, z, t. Similarly, <coughs> arguing for rho as we did earlier for V, we can write for x, z, 2, the flux as rho at y plus delta y, where x, z, and t have just been dropped for convenience from this functional notation. So rho at y plus delta y into v plus delta y plus delta y into delta x into delta z. So I make the same assumptions about rho at y plus delta y as uh, I did earlier for v at y plus delta y. If you work out the algebra exactly the same way, you get this kind of an expression. Uh, I will leave it to you to work out the algebra. What I am going to do instead is look at the physical implication of this. One other way of writing this uh, is as follows. I will now share the GIMP screen. One other way of writing it is uh, as d rho by dt equals minus rho dive u bar. Because what we had in that equation on the right hand side was uh, basically <coughs> minus rho divergence of v bar. Divergence of u bar we had actually seen earlier. It was multiplied by minus rho. And on the left hand side we had d rho by dt, which can be expanded as uh, this term is basically dou rho by dou t plus terms like u dou rho by dou x plus v dou rho by dou y plus w dou rho by dou z. So this was the equation that was shown there and this is the equation of conservation of mass also called the equation of continuity. <coughs> uh, what is of interest now is to understand what this equation means physically. I will leave it to you to derive this. It's straightforward algebra. Again, it's the truncation of the Taylor series that after the first term, you just have rho at y plus delta y into v at delta y plus delta y into delta x into delta z minus rho v into delta x into delta z. And uh, you divide by delta x, delta y, delta z, that's the volume, and work through the algebra. You have to add for the other two uh, axes, and uh, this is the equation that you will get. You will basically get these terms, and you will get uh, minus rho type v, so divergence of u bar. Okay, so what does it mean? Let's consider two points, one over here, let's say, which I call A, and another out here that I call B. 
Uh, let's say I'm measuring some property in both places. It could be anything, but let's talk of temperature. So this is typically what we do. We make a measurement at some location, and we keep repeating it in time, generating what's called a time series. So I put a probe out there on some mooring line, and maybe I have a thermistor chain, and I'm measuring temperature. So at that location, fixed in x and y, I can get temperature. If I have more than one thermistor, I get as a function of z, and I can get a function of time. Thermistor keeps uh, measuring in time. Maybe it relays the data in real time. Maybe I have to go back on a cruise and retrieve it to get the temperature. But either way, I have uh, values in time. That is what we typically measure. So any theory that you build has to account for this uh, <coughs> aspect of the measurement. <coughs> and this is the key difference between fluid and uh, solid mechanics. Now, Newton's law of uh, motion is basically written following a fluid parcel. So when we say we are talking of the change in density, it <coughs> makes sense only if you are following that parcel. So you take a parcel, <coughs> you follow it as it moves in the flow, and you look at how its density changes. Okay, That is the meaning of d rho by dt. Right, that's the rate at which the density of the parcel changes, and it's probably moving through the flow. <coughs> the trouble is, if you are looking at two points A and B, the it may so happen that the temperature at both A and B is the same and is changing in time. One example could be long-term measurements in the context of uh, global warming. You have one measurement at uh, Mumbai of sea level, and you use that as representative of the entire uh, Indian Ocean. So basically, what you are saying is that uh, everywhere in the Indian Ocean, the rate of change will be roughly the same. <coughs> when you talk in terms of global warming, again, it's based on a few measurements, and you say that it's representative of the whole basin. So if the temperature is going up by, say, uh, 0.1 degree Celsius for every 10 years, or whatever. Uh, you are saying that it happens at that rate all over the globe. So whether you are measuring at point A or point B, it does not matter. The rate at which temperature changes is the same. So it could happen. I have a flow, and let's say the flow is in this direction. It goes from A to B, and as always, I can orient my axis such that a and B fall on one of the coordinate axes. So let's say it is along the x-axis, and I will write x comma u to denote that. Okay. So I'm looking only at the u component of the uh, velocity field. Now, when the parcel moves from A to B. its temperature will change. It will not change because it has moved from A to B, but it will change because the temperature at A and B are changing. The temperature at A is changing, the temperature at B is changing, and both are changing at the same rate. So there is a change that the parcel will experience when it moves from A to B, irrespective of whether there is a difference in temperature between A and B or not. It does not matter. As long as the temperature is changing, the parcel will experience a change in the temperature. And that term is denoted by this first one, the partial derivative of temperature or uh, density with respect to time, if density is what we are looking at as the property. We could do the same thing with temperature. <clears throat> the quantity would be heat, and the measure of heat would be temperature. So we are looking at density, and that is dou rho by dou t. It could uh, so happen that temperature at A does not change, temperature at B does not change in time. The temperature at A is the same, the temperature at B is the same. Let's say you are uh, making measurement within a season and there is no change in temperature at B or A relative to the difference in temperature between them. This is possible. 
So the change at A or change at B is very small in comparison to the difference between the temperatures at A and B. In that case, if your fluid parcel moves from A to B, it still has to go through a change in temperature. Now that change in temperature comes not because temperature is changing at A or at B, but because there is a movement of the fluid parcel and when it comes to B, it must have the same temperature as the surrounding at that location because there is always an exchange of mass across the sides of that imaginary box that we imagine divides the fluid parcel. So this box is moving in space, but there is flow across it. That is the key distinction between a fluid and a solid. If I were to look at the motion of this projectile, this paperweight, there may be subatomic particles being exchanged between it and the uh, surrounding atmosphere, or even my hand, but uh, we don't bother about it. There is an entity, there is, this is an entity, there is an identity to it, I can track it. I can't do the same thing with the fluid. <clears throat> so it's an imaginary thing that I'm tracking, but there is exchange of mass across the interface, the, what do you call it, the surface that defines that uh, fluid parcel. So when the parcel moves from A to B now, though temperature is not changing at A or at B, the parcel will ex experience a change in temperature because it has moved in space. And the way you write it, in this case, if you're looking at only the X component, is delta rho, if you're looking at density, equals dou rho by dou x into delta x. Actually to be consistent with earlier I should use the small deltas in the case of both uh, delta rho and delta x to be consistent with what is used in the text there. <coughs> this again is the Taylor series. We have retained only the first term. So this delta rho is the change of density in the, in the horizontal direction? In the x direction. The question is, this delta rho, what does it represent? It represents the density difference between B and A. If this is the positive x direction as drawn here, then delta rho is rho at B minus rho at A. And that's equal to dou rho by dou x, which is the rate at which density changes in the x direction, multiplied by the distance between them. That's delta x. I divide by delta t. I now take the limit as delta t goes to 0. When I take that limit, this delta x by delta t is the one that for which I have to take the limit. And that is simply u. So you get u into dou rho by dou x. And this part would become uh, a rate of change of density with time. But now, not because there is a change in time at any given location, but because that fluid parcel that we are interested in is moving in space. So the total change that a fluid parcel experiences is the sum of the two. It may happen, and generally that's the case, that temperature at A is changing in time, temperature at B is changing in time, and there's a difference in temperature between A and B. So if a fluid parcel moves from A to B, there will be dou rho by dou t, that is local to A, local to B, and there will be this term, u dou rho dou x, that comes because of the translational motion. Okay. Okay, so that's how you get this equation. 
dou rho by dou t plus u dou rho by dou x and likewise v dou rho by dou y plus dou w dou rho by dou z equals minus rho into dou u by dou x plus dou v by dou y plus dou w by dou z. You just work out the algebra. So what this is telling you is that on the left hand side you have the rate of change of density as you track that parcel in uh, space. Now, should the right hand side have a negative sign, you must be able to justify this both mathematically and you should get that if you carry out the derivation uh, and uh, physically. Mathematically, you just carry out the derivation. What it's telling you is that if this divergence term is not zero, and uh, indeed density is never zero, so if the divergence is not zero, and that is how we define incompressibility, del dot u equals zero. If that is not zero, then the left hand side is not going to be zero. So the density will change as the parcel moves. So that is a net mass flux into or out of the parcel of the control volume. Basically it means that the density of the parcel can change. So when we said that this term is zero, in effect, what we are saying is that the left hand side is zero. That is actually what we wanted to say. That is why in textbooks you will find the derivation given first, the full derivation. Then they will say that d rho by dt, that is capital D being used in this case, the total derivative, which is the sum of what's called the local change, which does not bother about motion, and the advective or in fluid mechanics test, very often convective derivative, the other three terms that is uh, the change that is uh, due to advection, that is due to motion. So d rho by dt following the parcel has to be zero. That's basically what we said when we got this term, divergence of u equals zero. <coughs> Suppose there is net flow you just tell them there's a class for me. So if you have net uh, divergence, that is dou u by dou x plus dou v by dou y plus dou w by dou z is not zero, remember divergence means flow out of the box. If there is flow out of that box, it is positive. If it is not zero and it is positive, then the density inside that box or the parcel has to decrease. That's all it's saying. That is why you have to multiply by this minus sign. Okay. So suppose there is net mass flux out of the control volume, that is the product of density and divergence, which gives the volume flux is not zero, then the density inside the box must decrease. So I must have the negative sign. So, equation 4.8 is the statement of the law of conservation of mass. Start from the expressions we wrote down for the mass fluxes through sides xz1 and xz2 and work out algebra. Since density is also a function of space and time, the algebra is a little more complicated than for conservation of volume. So, you have two varying quantities now, and it is the extra variable that gives you the additional terms. While working out the algebra, however, and this is important if you really want to understand GFD. Interpret at each step the physical meaning of each term. If you don't do it now, you will not be able to do it later. So while you may be able to work out problems, you will not understand what is going on. In particular, what do the terms like V delta rho mean? Rho delta V is easier to understand, but what is V delta rho? Every time you write a term, you have to interpret it physically. Why the products? Why the signs? So look at it as a physical problem. The algebra is trivial. Don't look at it just as a problem in algebra. It's probably going to take you five minutes to work it out. But there is some physics in this. You must be able to understand those signs that come physically. That is when it makes sense. OK. So now we just go through some terminology that we basically use, some <laughs> notations. So we rewrite this expression a little differently. I'm going to write the LHS, the left-hand side, as a single term capital D rho by dt. The D is a capital. 
So d rho by dt is minus rho dive u, u is the velocity vector. Now this is the most compact form of the law of conservation of mass. What does it imply? I have taken here not a fixed volume, control volume defined by me in space, but I have taken a mass of fluid that I can identify, say by putting ink in a fluid and drawing the fluid pars uh, parcel with the ink. The trouble is that if you were to do it with actual ink, you find that it diffuses through the fluid. Then I observe this fluid parcel as it moves. Here we are assuming that there is an entity, there is flux into or out of it, and that is what the diffusion of ink is telling you. Uh, it will move in space because there is a flow, and I am going to observe it as it moves. This is what distinguishes fluid dynamics from solid body dynamics. This problem of identity of a parcel, the very need to define this parcel carefully. In solid body dynamics, all you say is that I assume the entire mass to be concentrated in the center of gravity. And when I say this body is moving, what I mean is I'm looking at the movement of the center of gravity. Now you're not talking of that. You actually have to define the parcel very carefully. It has to be small enough. It has to be big enough to satisfy certain conditions. Things inside it, its properties can change because each of these properties is a function of time and of space. Salinity changes from the northern bay to the northern Arabian sea. So if there is movement of water from one basin to the another, to other, there has to be a transport of salt. And this cannot be avoided. Likewise, the temperature differences, there has to be a transport of heat. There are this transport of momentum. Because as we shall see, the same principle applies. When you track a fluid parcel, because that is the entity for which you can write down Newton's law, you will get this d by dt, capital D, of the velocity vector. So if I observe the changes that are taking place within this parcel that I'm tracking, the changes in its mass are given by the left-hand side of this equation. This change is equal to the change that occurs due to local changes at one place given by the partial derivative with respect to time, that is dou rho by dou t, and changes that occur in space because the parcel moves through the space. This is given by the sum of the other three partial derivatives on the left hand side. The change depends on the velocity field and the density gradients within the field. So it depends on the velocity, it also depends on the density gradients. There are changes in density from one place to another or in any other property. This is an important point because we want to apply Newton's laws of motion to ensure conservation of momentum. And Newton's laws apply Newton's laws apply only to bodies of fluid parcels. They are not written for fields. And this is the basic transition we have made. Newton's law states that if I have a body or a fluid parcel, then the parcel's rate of change of momentum is equal to the net force applied on it. So I need the total derivative expressing the rate of change for a fluid parcel moving through space and conserving its identity rather than just the change at a location because the field is a function of time. There is yet another way to write this equation. If you combine these terms, you combine these terms, the three spatial derivatives on the left hand side and the divergence term on the right hand side, then you can rewrite it as dou rho by dou t plus divergence of rho into u bar equals zero. Equation 4. Point, this is not that easy to interpret. It's equation 4.8 that is more easy to interpret physically. The moment you write down, understand that this is the rate of change of density for that parcel as you track it in space. This is straightforward. Both are equivalent, however. Mathematically, there's no difference. And one may end up being more convenient to solve than the other. <laughs> the equation is defining the law of conservation of mass, irrespective of the form you use, 4.8, 4.9, or 4.10, is also called the equation of continuity. So what we have done is to allow for density changes, and I've extended the statement of conservation of volume to obtain a statement of conservation of mass. This is necessary because all fluids are not com incompressible. Air is a compressible fluid. In the atmosphere, when a parcel of air rises, it expands. And that's why it condenses. Volume increases because of the decrease in pressure. This leads to an increase in uh, this leads to an increase in density that exceeds the decrease in density due to the decrease in temperature. So the density of a parcel that of air that is rising decreases 
I think it should be the other way around. It is the decrease in density that it exceeds the increase in density because of the decrease in temperature. I think that's uh, to flip that uh, thing is there's a decrease in density because of the decrease uh, decrease in pressure, and that change in density exceeds the decrease in increase in density that takes place because temperature is decreasing. So the density of the parcel of air that is rising decreases. This is necessary in order that mass is conserved. In the oceans, however, I can ignore the left-hand side of equation 4.8, that is capital D by dt of rho, uh, because density in the oceans is almost constant. The density changes are within 2% of the mean in 99% of the ocean. So seawater is practically incompressible, and we can use a much simpler expression that results by setting the left-hand side of equation 4.9 to 0, which is what we did earlier. And the moment you set the left-hand side to 0, what you are saying is divergence of the flow field is equal to zero. So that's the law that is of interest to us. Okay, for those who are familiar with thermodynamics and differentials, uh, <coughs> there's a difference between a partial derivative, a total derivative, and a differential. Here we have used du by dt or uh, capital D or small d it depends on the textbook that you use. So it's not necessarily capital D. In most ocean and atmosphere texts, you will find capital D being used, but that is not necessarily a matter of convention. It's possible to use uh, small d, but not do. To express the rate of change of u with respect to t, if u is a function uh, well, normally you use this if it is uh, if there's only one independent variable, but there are textbooks that use small d u by dt to uh, talk of capital D u by dt. So it's something that you have to look at carefully and uh, decide which way the author is going. Normally you use small d u by dt if there is only one independent variable, that is time in this case. If u is also a function of x, then its rate of change with t is expressed using the partial derivative, that is dou u by dou t. The differential arises when I want to express the change in u that occurs as a consequence of changes in both t and x, that is du equals dou u by dou t into dt plus dou u by dou t into dx. This is typically how you write a differential in uh, partial differential equations. The total derivative is something unique to fluid mechanics. It arises because we have little option but to consider the field. All our measurements, almost all actually, are made in a field, not by following a fluid parcel because it's very difficult. You can take a look at chapter 3, which uh, is about thermal line circulation, and uh, it'll tell you why it is impossible or almost impossible to use what <coughs> is called Lagrangian measurements, where you uh, track the parcel or uh, move in space and make your measurements. Here the word almost is used because there are drifters uh, that do that. But they are quite rare. Such measurements are very rare. Such measurements following a fluid parcel are uncommon not only in oceanography but also in other fluid flow phenomena. So if you take a piston engine and want to talk about what's happening inside it, you would actually put a probe and this done outside the engine at the exhaust when you go for a pollution check. They put a probe outside at a point and they make a measurement and what they're looking for is a steady state. They wait for some time and that uh, meter will stabilize giving you what is the exhaust and then they decide whether it's within the emission norms and accordingly you get your certificate. It is much easier to deploy instruments across the region of interest and make a time series measurement at each location, thereby obtaining a field that is a function of both space and time. There is another reason too for using this approach in fluid mechanics. It is not only that we are constrained to make measurements in the sense of a field, but also we often need the solution as a field. Take for example air temperature. We do not make measurements following an air parcel. We don't do this. We deploy our thermometers to map a field of temperature in space and time. But this is also what we are interested in. We want to know the temperature as a function of space and time. I would like to know how temperature changes uh, at Fungi in Goa or you might be interested in what's happening in Hyderabad 
Now you can't do this if you track a parcel in space. So you end up making measurements in uh, at specific locations, partly because that is what can be done. It's convenient to do that. And partly because that is what you actually want. You want to know what is happening at a location. It is this convergence of measurement limitations and of our objectives that make us use the complicated expression in equation 4.8 in preference to a simpler expression in equation 4.9. Now this is 4.9, d rho by dt equals minus rho dive u. Now, there are many more terms in 4.8, but uh, the reason we use it is basically because that is how we make our measurements and that is how we want our answers. Application of Newton's law, however, is possible only for a parcel that has a definite identity. This is the problem. This necessitates use of equation 4.9 also, or rather 4.9 is the actual equation. Now in this case, not of motion, <coughs> and the context is not Newton's law, but when you're talking of conservation of mass, again, conservation of mass makes sense only when you're talking of some identity. Otherwise, it makes no sense. What are you conserving? That is the catch. Hence, we use both forms in uh, fluid mechanics. Uh, 4.8, however, is what we use when we write the difference equations to be solved using a computer. Now, <laughs> this uh, remarkable jump was made by Leonard Euler, who wrote down for the first time the equations governing fluid flow. He didn't include friction. And as we shall see, it's a much more complicated thing. But uh, it was Euler who realized that there is this um, issue of uh, the total derivative. Because there is a change in time locally, and there's a change that comes in properties because of movement in space. And uh, even today, Euler's equations of motion that we shall see uh, next uh, time are still being solved. Because if you take, for example, the flow around a vehicle or an airplane outside the frictional boundary layer, as long as you're looking at reasonably uh, subsonic flows, not supersonic flows, outside the frictional boundary layer, <coughs> the flow can be assumed to be frictionless. And the moment you do that, you basically have oilless equations. So if you go to a company like Boeing or any place where these equations are solved, maybe the National Aerospace Laboratories, you find them solving the equations of motion with friction and without friction. It's still run. So there are still codes that are written to solve all those equations. They're still important. Uh, I think it would be better to break here. I don't want to start conservation of momentum now. Uh, maybe I'll just go over it a bit to introduce the topic. Um, we have so far looked at the conservation of mass. We have not used any equation of motion. And we need uh, the second law, the law of conservation of momentum. And we shall apply Newton's laws. <clears throat> so if I have a ball and I want to apply Newton's law to this ball to determine its motion, it states that force equals mass times acceleration. Uh, we are assuming that uh, we can take mass out of the derivative in um, the equation that determines Newton's law. And I can turn that around and say that if I know the force acting on the ball and I know its mass, then I will know how it's going to move, which is basically what you do. So if you have a 2D plane of this kind, you have a projectile of this kind, a mass m, you basically track it in space. Now what are you going to do? You have a fluid parcel, delta x0, delta y0, delta z0 at time t0. <coughs> that is its uh, um, sides and delta x naught into delta y naught into delta z naught, that's capital del delta capital V naught is the volume at time t naught, it moves in space and at time t1, let's say it's located here. The sides have now morphed delta x1, delta y1, delta z1. For simplicity, we let's assume that it's still uh, rectangular sides. Is at time t1, the volume has changed. And um, what do we do now? The, what we had here is not quite what we have here. I can't 
connect the two the way I can connect the object here and the object here at two different times in solid body motion. So that is my problem. When I am talking of solids, I would merrily go ahead and write if it is a ball thrown up vertically, <coughs> then the only force is the acceleration due to gravity and uh, it's going to pull the ball down. So I say ma equals f equals minus mg with minus sign coming because of the sign convention where uh, the vector v is minus g into k and our k if you remember points vertically upward. Um, so if I can apply this law then I can calculate the acceleration of this ball, I can apply Newton's law to it. This is the acceleration of the ball as it moves. So I am not using a field here, I don't need the concept of a field. But I am looking at an individual ball here, I am looking at a body strictly a point mass concentrated at the center of gravity as it moves. Now what happens in the case of fluid? I have a small parcel of fluid that is moving and let's say I put in some ink and this is typically done. There are things called tracers, uh, radioisotopes that are used to uh, track water masses. Salinity is used as a water mass tracer, dissolved oxygen is used and you can also use uh, radioisotopes to track uh, specific water masses. Chapter 3 talks a bit about them but I am not going to bother about that. So suppose you have put some ink to track it to see how it moves. You can apply this law to the rate of change of velocity. That is the acceleration will now be du by dt where I have capital D's. If I follow that parcel. Now we have to note that just as we saw in the case of conservation of mass, these laws were written to look at individual bodies like this ball or apple and uh, the moon going around the earth. It's equally good for that. We are going to use this law for a fluid. Uh, in which there are no distinct entities. That's a problem. There is nothing like an apple sitting inside the fluid. So we consider an imaginary apple that I will color by putting some neutrally buoyant color in it and then look at how this colored apple moves in the water. And my colored apple is one with rectangular sides. So I'm going to draw ideas from Newton's laws and express them in terms of fields. There are many books I have recommended for this course the one by Pijush Kundu, he derives all these equations and uh, there is one by Adrian Gill. Uh, but uh, I am not going to worry about that. I think what the derivation that is given here is reasonable. Our interest is not so much in uh, the details of the mathematics which you can follow by following a textbook but rather in understanding the connection between the phenomenon that we are interested in explaining, the physics that define the phenomena that are of interest to us and the mathematics that describes the physical system. So we have a strange aspect ratio here, we cannot uh, escape that, small vertical scale in comparison to horizontal scale, rotating frame, spherical uh, system. And Newton's law states that when you sit on a rotating frame, you encounter forces that are not fundamental forces, they are not like gravity, but arises a consequence of non inertial frame of reference, pseudo forces. We also need to worry about the kind of velocities we are going to encounter because, after all, we are, our interest is to understand what we have seen in the observations. We don't see velocities like those of an electron or an airplane. If you look at current meter observations, you are talking of a few tens of centimeters per second, maybe a meter per second. That's the kind of velocities we are talking of. But the components are not, not so tip, whatever it is. That's very specific. But most of the time, ocean currents have a velocity of a few tens of centimeters per second. Now, there is a distinction, as we noted, between horizontal and vertical direction. If we look at the vertical velocity, which cannot be measured directly, the Velocities are no longer tens of centimeters per second, it's fraction of a centimeter per second. Too small to be measured directly with any instrument. So when you are talking in terms of, for example, the global thermal line circulation, everything is inferred. Inferred from temperature and salinity measurements and maybe some other properties. In any case, the equations we write have to take this uh, fact into account, this fundamental difference between the vertical scale and the horizontal scale. Changes in density are only a few percent of the mean value, 
and we'll take that into account. In fact, we have already done that. We've said that we will not bother about uh, the capital D rho by dt term. We will assume incompressibility and say that the divergence is equal to zero. Now, the other catch is the following. Uh, when you look at a fluid flow, you find something called turbulence. And no matter what you measure, at what interval you measure, you can always define a mean flow and there will be fluctuations with respect to that. In fact, Galileo made that statement. He said that he had greater difficulty in uh, understanding the flow of water in front of his eyes than he had in understanding the motion of the planets so distant from him. And uh, Newton put that in a neat framework. It was a century after Newton that Euler came in, still frictionless fluid flows. Practically a century after Euler that uh, friction was introduced into the equations. Uh, GFD starts uh, much later, yeah, but uh, we still have problems in uh, solving the equations that govern geophysical fluid flows. And the key problem is turbulence. So the derivation of the equations is things uh, something you will find in textbooks, and I'm not going to look at that in great detail. Uh, for example, I'm not going to worry about how that Coriolis term comes into being. Physically, you understand it, and you look at Kundo's book, or you look at any other book, it will tell you how that uh, term comes into play. So this is the kind of ocean that we are interested in. And uh, we are also interested in scales. We saw that. We have to be very clear about the kind of scales we are talking of when we are talking of motion. We are not talking of wind waves or tides. We are not talking of global thermal and circulation. We are not talking even of eddies and mesoscale flows. So our time scales and space scales are restricted within the huge uh, spectrum of uh, motions that are possible in the ocean and atmospheres. Now, if you look at data, you find oscillations. And if you take a spectrum, you will find peaks in the spectrum. That's something like a period that is present in the flow. It's not like the motion of a pendulum. It's not as uh, rhythmic, it's not as regular. But there is some periodicity in the oscillation. So there are time scales, these periods associated with the motions that you see in current meter data. There are also spatial scales. You may find, for example, that the current seems to decay over a distance. And the cross-shore distance is smaller than the long-shore distance. If, for example, you are looking at a wave propagating along the coast, you will find that the long-shore scale might be a few thousand kilometers. But the cross-shore scale will not be greater than 100 kilometers. Typically, it's of that order. We're talking of 100 to 200 kilometers. And very often, much less than that. If you look at thermal line circulation, the horizontal scale is over 40,000 kilometers, the entire globe. If you look at the current of the coast of India, it decays offshore over about 100 km. So it's a cross shoal length scale. So these kind of scales have a strong bearing on the equations. Because if this is what we're interested in, anything that's happening faster is turbulence. Anything that's changing over smaller scales is turbulence. We'll have to get rid of that by some means. So at any level that you look at in fluid flows, there's turbulence. There's turbulence even when you look at a small box, the size of this paperweight. If you add a box like this, you solve the Navier-Stokes equation, you still have to worry about uh, <coughs> um, a few scales. But the range of scales is nowhere compared to what you get when you're looking at geophysical flows. So the time scales ranges from seconds to over a decade, but we are talking of time scales of the order of a year, say so six months to a year, for most of the phenomena that we will be looking at. We've already looked at this in the PDF file. I won't go into that. And I think I'll stop here. We will start tomorrow on Friday at 3 p.m. Is that OK? Friday, 3 p.m.?
uh, with what are called Euler equations. So the idea here is to give you a feel for the Is Friday 3 p.m. okay? Yeah, uh, uh, for Incoise it is off day. Pardon? For Incoise it is off day. There is no work. It is because of the... Oh, what's there on Friday? Friday. Commentary leave something is there for Friday. Pardon? The Friday is only for Incoise, sir. Oh, okay. Uh, and tomorrow afternoon you have that uh, other class, is it? Ajin sir, uh, tomorrow afternoon? Yes. Yes sir. Which class? Yeah, I thought you have a fluid mechanics class on Tuesday, th Tuesdays and Thursdays. No. Can you make it tomorrow afternoon? Yeah, sure, 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 sure sir. Would tomorrow afternoon be okay? Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Okay, there is a class here for some students from 2.30 to 3.30, so we'll start at 4 o'clock. We'll have a one hour class. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank Fine, you. tomorrow 4 o'clock. Yeah. And I'll be basically going over Euler equations, so if you want to, you can read that and come. That will make it a little easier to go through. Okay. And uh, uh, we could take questions now, but it's better that you come back tomorrow with them. Okay, sir. You can go over what's being done, and if you have any questions, we'll start with that, and then uh, go on the rest of the class. Thank you, sir. Okay then. So see you tomorrow at 4 o'clock.